<laughs> okay, um, so my name is Shachaf um, from Elenox. And I'm Elena Agostini from NVIDIA. Cliff Burdick from Viasat. And so on this talk, we're going to present a use case where the DPDK can be used along with Accelerator as the GPU. And in specific, we are going to address the data movement between the NIC device and the accelerator. Okay, so unlike the common practice where the data is being moved from the NIC to the host memory, and from the host memory to the accelerator, either by the accelerator DMA engine or by the CPU mem copy, here we're going to present a way to move the data from the NIC directly for the GPU. And we'll show how efficient and, and important it is. It is. And this kind of approach becoming even super critical when we look into the future where we're going to have more high-speed devices that we support 200 gig and 400 gig. And on such cases, the bottleneck will no longer be the CPU. It's going to be the, the data movement because once you support such amount of bandwidth, the CPU, the, the host memory caches will not be able to hold all this data. And that means that the data will drain from the caches to the disk and will experience very, very large latencies. So this is why this kind of approach is super critical, not only for today, rather also when we look in the future. So now we'll, Elena will present GPU DPDK. Okay, thank you. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, so let's start with GP Direct RDMA because Everything we are going to present in this session relies on this technology. So GP Direct RDMA is a technology from NVIDIA. I don't know what happened. Yeah. So GP Direct RDMA uh, is a technology, uh, in a, is an NVIDIA technology, and basically in a nutshell, with GP Direct RDMA, um, from a third party device, you can, um, I don't know why it keeps going to the next slide, well, anyway. Um, in a nutshell, you can basically read and write the GPU memory from the network card, so a third party PCIe device, for example, again, a network card, without the need of additional uh, system memory copies or uh, the involvement of the CPU. So for example, you can allocate a buffer in uh, GPU memory by means of CUDA malloc, and then you can just directly call MPI send to send that data from the GPU, again, fetching them directly from the network card. <laughs> Let, let's do one stop. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can start the presentation. Um, uh, I keep playing with it. Okay. So, um, during this whole session, we suppose that in your system you have an NVIDIA GPU and has a network card, of course, a Mellanox network card, at least Connect X5. So in order for you to reach the best performance when doing GPU Direct RDMA, not only in the PDK, just in general, you need to have this topology, this internal topology in your system. So you have your NVIDIA GPU, your network card, and you have to connect them through an additional layer of PCIe. Uh, this is an example with an additional external PCIe switch. In this way, if you have, for example, your network card that is able to receive data at 100 gigabits per second, you are, roughly speaking, enabling the same the same bandwidth, uh, the same data rate in the dialogue between the network card and the GPU. So GPDPDK, in a nutshell, GPDPDK uh, is basically composed by two, uh, two uh, most important elements. The first one is GPDART RDMA. And the second one is the nice feature called external buffer that has been introduced in DPDK since DPDK 1805. So basically, GPU DPDK um, means that we introduce a set of NVIDIA API to create a mempool like this. So in this mempool, you have the headers of the MBUF, uh, the, yeah, the headers of the MBUFs in uh, system memory. It can be also pinned system memory, so you can reach them from the GPU. And the payload of the MBUFs is in GPU memory. So what happens? For example, when you're receiving packets, your network card Thanks to GPDirect RDMA, uh, move the whole, the whole packet from the network, let's say, to the, to the payload of the MBUF in GPU memory. And through the RX queue and the CPU, it fills the headers of the MBUFs. So this is how it works. Of course, it works also when transmitting. The problem when you're transmitting is that you cannot, for the moment, you cannot use inlining. 
Um, so now you have your all, all the packets. You, are receiving, you keep receiving packets in GPU memory. And maybe the reason for doing this is because you have some very cool CUDA kernel that want to process in parallel the packets you're receiving. So in the package of GPU DPDK, we, re we release L2 forward improve it with the NVIDIA API to show you how you can interact with the packets that are keep coming in GPU memory. Uh, you have a bunch of options. For example, you can pre-launch a kernel persistent on the stream of the GPU that is polling a memory area in, let's say, for example, host pinned memory area, waiting for new packets. And as soon as there are new packets to be processed, the persistent kernel just process the packet, do any kind of computation, and so on. Or another option you have is to spend some time batching the packets. And so as soon as you receive, for example, 64 packets, you can launch a new CUDA kernel that is specifically works that to specifically uh, process the, 60, the burst of 64 packets you, you received, and so on. Another option may be to use CUDA graph. So all of these options are in the L2 forward and the uh, example. So, there may be some problem if you have the whole packet in GPU memory, right? So for example, if you are implementing your, if you have your own network protocol and you are sending Ethernet frames, but your Ethernet address is encapsulating something else, some custom header network protocol you need for your application, maybe it's better for you to receive the first part of the packet in system memory, so CPU memory, in order to process it on the CPU, and the remaining part, so the actual payload of your packet in GPU memory. So for this reason, and this is the use case required by, by Viasat, um, for this reason we implemented this new feature called header split, header data split. Um, in, with this, basically with this feature it relies on MBUF chaining and you can receive a single packet saying that I want the first part of my packet in system memory and I want the second part, so the remaining bytes of my packet in GPU memory using, again, chain, chaining the MBUS in re when receiving. So this is the first benchmark. As I said, in the GP GPU DPDK package, there are two examples, actually. Test PMD, that is basically the common test PMD, improved with GPU memory. So when you're doing IO forwarding, you can choose to use GPU memory instead of system memory. So um, in this example, I'm I have two machines. One running test PMD has a generator, so only in transmission. And on the other side, I have test PMD that is doing forward, IO forwarding using GPU memory. So um, the chart here is just to prove, just to show you how, I mean, the fact that when you're, um, let's say, 1K packets, 2K packets, using GPU memory, using system memory, you're kind of reaching the full throughput. But the problem is that when you're using small packets, you cannot use inlining with GPU memory, so you may suffer in the throughput. So, you know, it's just to give you an overview and an understanding of what's going on. The second benchmark I would like to show, to show you is the L2 forward benchmark. So, in this example, we still have one machine running test PMD, has a generator, and on the other machine, on the other side, there is L2 forward, uh, basically, L2 forward receives the packet in GPU memory, processes the pa packets, swapping the MAC addresses uh, in each packet, and then transmit back to the generator the, uh, let's say, modified packets. So in this chart here, I'm showing how the performance may be affected with respect to the choice you want to do. So for example, if you're doing no swap at all, so just receiving and forwarding the packets, the blue line, uh, I mean, the performance kind of in line of what I showed you in the previous slide. But then you, if you would decide to process the packets with a persistent kernel, as you can see, the additional latency is not so much. But when you go to the dedicated kernel mode, so I'm waiting for 64 packets, and then I launch a CUDA kernel, uh, your performance may suffer from a lot of latency. So I don't want to say that Persistent kernel is always the best solution because if you're, if you're using persistent kernels with GPDirector DMA, you have to fix other stuff. I mean, there are, other, there are some drawbacks, other problems. We can discuss about them even offline. It's not a problem. But uh, this is just to say that there are many use cases, and it depends on what you want to do and what you want to achieve with your application. And you can explore all different approaches in order to find the best, again, solution for your application. 
So this is my final slide, just to say that right now we are releasing GPDPDK to selected partners under NDA. But in the future, we will release GPDPDK in the context of iReal SDK. As you may know, uh, NVIDIA recently uh, announced that, well, announced that we started to work in the 5G wireless run context. So uh, in the context of iReal SDK, we will release two SDKs. One of these is KubeNF, and so KubeNF is kind of a superset, which includes GPDPDK. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <clears throat> so, we actually see these use cases um, as a general use case, mm -hmm. not relatedly, uh, specifically related to GPU. And it means that we will, see, we will see a need that the application wants to have more tight control on where the data exactly is being placed. So today when you have a DPDK application, you create memory pool, and this memory pool is being populated by memory from the CPU, more probably from the huge pages. And this is good for the majority of the application, for, but, from the, uh, but for the specific application that wants to use a specific acceleration, would want, they would want also to control the, way, the, the place the data is being placed. So when we think about it for upstream, we want to extend the mempool APIs to be able to populate the mempool with any kind of memory. So we can, for example, create a new mempool that holds external buffers, meaning each mbuff pointing to another buffer of some memory. And this memory can be either host memory, or it can be GPU memory, or it can be disk memory map memory. And the application can now decide the way it wants to manage its mempool according to the buffer it populated it with. So this is, for example, one new mempool that contains only external buffers, and the application will have a, a way to control which type of memory each external buffer will hold, and this memory is going to be persistent for the mbuff. It's not like the classic model of external buffer when you attach detach, those mbuff will, will going to be persistent. Another way to use it is also to do header data split. So you can populate the mempool with uh, non-homogeneous mbuffs. One mbuff will be for the CPU memory, and one mbuff will be for the GPU memory. And the size may not be equal. So that when the, when the PMD will consume two mbuffs and connect them with a chain, portion of the data will be in the CPU, and portion of the data will be in the GPU memory. This is the exactly header data split Elena mentioned. And last thing is that some PMDs use inline in order to uh, uh, reduce the PCI overhead and to reach the maximum rates of, for example, 100 gig. And we see today that when the host uh, memory is being used for data and for inline, it's very, it's very, very efficient. But when you need to inline memory not as part of the host memory system, it comes out with a large overhead. So we'd like also to have some fine grain control for the application to hint the PMD when it's proper and when it's not proper to do inline. And this is, again, to do the maximum tuning in order to hit the maximum uh, bandwidth. Um, so next, we'll go to Cliff to present an actual use case about how all of this is being used in a real application. Thank you. So my name is Cliff Burdick. I work at Viasat. Um, one of our products that we sell is Viasat, or is satellite internet. Um, so we're a global satellite internet provider that's residential and mobile. So if you flew over on a plane, you may have been using our internet service on there. Um, and in turn, you may have been using DPDK in the back end. So we've been using DPDK since 2.x to do the Mac layer packet processing and above. So things like traffic steering for the users, um, packet reassembly, and things like that. Um, about two years ago, we started looking at migrating some of our signal processing code out of FPGAs and into GPUs. And the main reason for that is, uh, although FPGAs are really good at doing signal processing, there's a lot of turnaround time for developing FPGAs. They're very slow to compile, they're slow to develop. Once you have them working, it's great, but if you need to make changes, it could take a long time before that changes in the field. Um, so GPUs give you the capability of doing rapid prototyping on uh, signal processing work. Second thing is they're highly parallel, um, and they're, I would say, quasi-real-time, so they're fast enough to where, for signal processing, they're, they're good enough for real-time processing. Um, the modern GPUs have thousands of cores on them, so as long as you can keep them fed, they can uh, finish the task very quickly. And for signal processing, some packet loss is actually okay, because it has error correction built into the packets, so you don't need a lot of the same 
um, error correction that you have on, on the IP layer and above. So what we started to do was use multiple 100 gig NICs to keep feeding the processing pipeline. The reason why we chose 100 gigs is because for our type of workload, anything less than that wasn't really keeping the GPU busy enough. And GPUs are very expensive, and you want to keep them fed with data. Otherwise, they sit there idle. So, but one of the problems is the CPU only needs to know a few bytes in the header of the packet for the control logic. So even though the packets might be four to eight kilobytes in size, jumbo frames, the CPU only needs to know things like the sequence number and who it came from. And besides that, everything else in the packet is, is kind of extra stuff that the CPU doesn't need to see. So, and the payload essentially is processed entirely in the GPU. So all the signal processing happens in the GPU. So we have a legacy DPDK-based application that does this, and we started hitting memory bandwidth app, uh, limitations early on. Um, I'll go over that more in the next slide. And as we got to larger and larger systems, this problem was greatly exacerbated. So we also analyzed RDMA protocols like Rocky and iWarp. Um, we hit a couple issues with those. One was the to hit line rate at 100 gigabits, we had to do really large transfer sizes in RDMA. Um, really large meaning uh, significantly larger than a jumbo frame, something like 16K to several megabytes large to hit 90, meg 90 gigabits per second. The bigger issue, though, is that you, we sometimes don't have control over the senders. And RDMA requires you to implement the protocol on both sides. And if we can't control the protocol that the sender is sending, we can't use RDMA. Um, and then last is a lot of these protocols are tolerant to data loss. So they'll do things like retransmits, which we don't want at all. If the packet's lost, just like in you know, Netflix or any VoIP application, you usually just don't even want to transmit it, because by that time, it's, it doesn't matter. So this is a, I would say, a typical DPDK processing pipeline, but in this case, there's some GPUs in there. So on the bottom left, we're getting data in at 100 gigabits per second. We have, in this case, two receive L cores that are processing the data, doing things like network to host, um, doing any scaling on the packets that needed to happen. And then through ring buffers, that goes into the processing cores, which then go to system memory, up to GPU, back from the GPU, back to the transmit, and then back out the NIC. So you can see that whole step right there is very inefficient, because every time a packet comes into the processing thread, it has to store it into system memory. Then when all the packets are reassembled in system memory, it has to make a copy to the GPU. The GPU does some work. When the GPU is done, it has to copy them back to the CPU memory and then ship them out over the NIC. And those processing threads not only are doing mem copies, but they're really busy doing other things like reassembling the packets in the right order because we're getting them out of order. And also, they have to be the ones that look at the GPU to see when the work is done. So those cores are not only getting in packets, but they have to keep checking to see if the GPU is done with the work. Because uh, with CUDA, the way that you see if a GPU is complete is you have things called events, which you constantly pull to see if the work is done. Um, we started hitting memory bandwidth limitations around 400 gigabits per second, and uh, that was what our measured memory bandwidth was on these systems. You, you can go higher than that, um, but for our access patterns, that was common. But hitting 400 gigabits of memory bandwidth doesn't mean that you can hit 400 gigabits of packet processing, because you can see there's a lot of transfers back and forth to memory that are duplicating the same packets. So you're, you're effectively going to be cut in half or even more from that. So this is one of the more dense systems or the larger systems that I was referring to. So this is a Supermicro 9029. It has 16 100 gig NICs in it and 16 V100 uh, Volta NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so in this case, with 16 100 gig NICs, you can see that there's a pretty big bottleneck at the bottom. So it, on the top, very top left, you can see every two GPUs and NICs are connected to a single PCIe switch. At each of those, each of those are going at 100 gigabits per second to the switch, fully non-blocking. And then there's a copy of that eight times all across. But if you try to transfer the data down one level, you're limited to 100 gigabits per second going to the next layer of PCIe switches. And then two of those feed into a single switch. And then again, back to the CPU at 100 gigabits per second. And uh, currently, the, the Xeons that we're using could hold uh, roughly two of these 16 PCIe uh, switches on them, so you can't really fan out the GPUs and NICs directly into the CPUs either. Um, so by looking at this picture, it's obvious that if you could, you'd want to transfer data directly from the CPU to the NIC, or the GPU to the NIC, rather. Um, 
The other thing that's not really clear from looking at this picture is why would you use this type of architecture if you could just possibly break off a slice of that and have a, a single CPU connected to two GPUs and two NICs? And the reason is, what I'm not drawing here is these GPUs are connected by a very high-speed backplane that it runs at about a terabit per second that's fully non-blocking between all the GPUs. So if you have any work that needs to transfer data from a GPU to another GPU, you wouldn't want to go through these PCIe switches anymore. You definitely don't want to go out over the network. You want to use this backplane fabric that's there. And those typically are only on the higher-end servers that are more dense like this. So this is a, a picture of our processing pipeline before and after the changes for the header data split that uh, Elena was referring to. In the top left, that's the old way that we used to do it. The headers and payload used to come into CPU memory out of order. The CPU thread would get those in, copy them into a place in memory where they were back in order, and then you'd have this really large chunk of data that's usually tens of megabytes large before you transferred it over to the GPU memory and then started kicking off the work. Now, when we converted this into the uh, header data split way, the big change was that now only the headers were coming into CPU memory and all the data was going into GPU memory. But if you look at the headers, there's two kinds. There's the CPU MBUF that has the CPU MBUF plus the, uh, the header data of the packet. That's IP, UDP, Ethernet, and uh, our custom UDP payload. And then uh, after that, there's a GPU MBUF that's chained that only has a device pointer. There's no actual CPU data attached to that. So now the only thing you have to do is when you want to reorder the packets, you just reorder the device pointers in CPU memory. Then when you copy those over to GPU memory, that tells the GPU which order the packets should be in after it finishes processing. And then when you ship them back out, it's already ordered properly. Um, I think that's our last slide, actually. Uh, the last thing to point out there is that data copy from CPU to GPU is about 500 times less data copied in that case because essentially all that means is instead of copying a whole jumbo frame packet that's 4,000 bytes or 8,000 bytes, you're copying a single pointer to that packet into GPU memory. So thank you. Questions? Just one right here. Okay, um, how do you sync between the packets? If the, the data arrives to the GPU and the header arrives to the CPU, you need some kind of signal. Who reads the cooking? Or how do you know when a packet arrives? How do you sync between the two CPUs? Between the GP, GPU and the CPU? How do you know when the packet is completed? Uh, I think the question is, how does the GPU know it has some data to work on? Yeah, it depends on the approach you want to, to, to use. If you have, for example, a persistent kernel, as I said, that is running on the GPU, right, and it's waiting for new packets, to process new packets, uh, then you may kind of implement some kind of communication protocol between the CPU and the GPU. So for example, you have, uh, some flag, some memory area in system memory that is pinned so it's visible from the GPU, and the GPU keeps polling on that memory area. And as soon as there are new packets, the CPU can update that memory area. So the GPU sees the updates and says, okay, there are new packets. And then the CPU has to provide in some way the pointers to the payload that the GPU should process. Or otherwise you can, like, as I said, you, you prepare on the CPU the pointers to the payload of the MBUF you want to process and then you launch a new CUDA kernel saying, okay, this is the list of pointers uh, you have to process. So there are a lot of approaches for to do yeah, that. It's, it's a huge discussion. I think for anyone who's not familiar with GPU programming, the term kernel is essentially you're launching some work on the GPU and then you're waiting to see when it's done at some point. And the CPU is the one that manages all that stuff. Um, so the two options she presented before, which was the uh, persistent kernel and the um, basically launching a large batch, both of those will, uh, you're, in those cases, you're getting notifications that a packet came in, but you don't know what it is. So you, you know that the packet is there, but you don't know what the contents are. So the GPU has to be the one that tells you what the contents are. So the nice thing about the header data split is the CPU knows exactly what it needs to know just to launch the work without actually going to the GPU to pull anything from memory. Okay, 
Uh, maybe oh, one question on the adjacent area. Uh, uh, what kind of signal processing functions are implemented on GPU right now? Is it, are you doing FFTs, DFTs, uh, polar in, encoding, decoding? So in production, nothing. Um, yeah. This is, it, it's experimental at this point. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but all the typical signal processing uh, functions like FFTs, correlations, things like that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they are all part of the CUDA library, is that the structure? Well, so some of the, one of the slides was the KU baseband. I don't know what that is, but that uh, CUDA typically has enough libraries with it. That there's an FFT library, um, but then there's a, a bunch of other libraries, either third party or from NVIDIA, that you can make your own signal processing chain from it. Um, so there's, there's a number of papers out there that have done this long before us. Um, but I don't know of any cohesive signal processing package in CUDA. There's image processing, there's the FFT library, but that's used by other people other than just signal processing. Thank you. Hey, great talk. Thank you all the way back. So, uh, so we know GPUs are great throughput machines, and then when they're hanging off of a distant PCI bus, it takes a lot of data to keep them happy chugging along. So in a previous investigation of packet processing using GPUs, we found that we had to do a lot of uh, batching to keep them happy processing. So can you share your uh, experience in this, especially you might have some latency-induced uh, implications? Are you talking to me or? Uh, well, whoever wants to take it. Uh, you're referring to the fact that when the GPU needs to process to do the networking, it has larger latencies? Yeah, the okay. simple share of bandwidth delay product yeah. being larger and keeping it happy requires a lot of batching. Yeah, so bandwidth. at 100 gigabits per second, you have just over a small period of time, you have a lot of packets that you can start a batch on. Um, so there, there's, you definitely don't want to launch a kernel for every packet because then you'd be dominated by the kernel launch time. But you can wait for, let's say, 1,000, 10,000 packets and then launch a kernel. And that's typically enough to, so that the CPU is not the bottleneck of launching kernels, where the GPU is busy enough with the work. I guess it depends on the work that you're doing on the GPU. That's, that's what we found. So you, for our particular use case, I would say it's about five to 10,000 packets that it's batching. I, I, th I think there are a few points here. One is that when you launch a GPU, you need to have enough work to make it uh, efficient. And the second thing is how the GPU can do networking uh, in front of the NIC. So, so what we presented so far just addressed the data movement, so that we move the data to the place it belongs. But we do look in for the next generation on efficient ways for the GPU to communicate with the NIC without the, NIC, the need to have the CPU in the middle. Right? This is really challenging because the GPU by its nature is, has a lot of threads and this conversation between those is very, really challenging, but this is something we have in plans uh, to look at. Yeah, well, <coughs> sorry. Well, uh, I have one question about memory. So uh, when there's multi-process comes in, so I assume you are used like share virtual memory to, uh, to have either the CPU memory and the GPU memory uh, being visible to that process. So then when you view the uh, descriptor for the device, so are you going to register that memory region to your device uh, first? which is our address translation servicing device need to be support to in order to support this usage? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't quite get the question. You're asking how can we do the zero copy between the NIC and the uh, No, um, my question is uh, from uh, when there's multi-process comes in. So we, uh, we can't use just a physical address because uh, that is not secure. So you are going to use the virtual address, right? Yeah. So when you use virtual address, so either the host memory and the GPU memory need to be uh, being visible and isolated with the, each process. Yeah. And then, uh, so uh, because you, you, you do the DMA direct to the GPU memory, rather than go to the platform, right? Go to the uh, CPU side. So there's some place to do the address translation between the virtual to the physical. Yeah. So if that's your uh, in-device, you need to sort of the like, address translation service yeah. to provide that. So then, you, before you doing the DMA transaction, you have to fill in the tables in the device. Yeah. So this use case was presented with Connect X5 for Mellanox and GPU, and Mellanox PMDs, for example, worked with virtual memory. 
okay, so that we can register to the device a virtual memory, and the Mellanox kernel knows to map between the virtual memory and the physical memory. And in addition, the device holds some translation units that can do the, all, all this translation on die in a secure way. Something similar to the IMMU uh, you have on uh, Intel chips. So, so by using that, we can have shared memory with multiple processes, all using virtual memory. While in fact, the memory translation is being done by the device, and uh, it's either go to a physical memory associated with the GPU, or it's go to a physical memory associated by the CPU. So th this is more or less the way it's done. Okay, so then before, before you do the NQ and DQ, you have to register memory region to the device yeah. for that external mempool. Yeah, so the, the memory on this model is quite static. You have a big pool, mempool, and we register it once, and then we use all these buffers all the time, and we don't have the overhead of uh, register and deregister on the data path. But yeah, the, 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 all the memory is being pre-registered, and then being used on the data path um, along with the device uh, translation unit. Okay, then uh, how to partition the memory for GPU uh, memory depends on the application. The okay. process needs exactly. to manage that. Exactly. And, okay, thank you. Yeah, I had uh, uh, one clarifying question first. Did you say the NIC actually directly DMAs to GPU memory? Yeah. So if you would do the heritage split, the NIC would have to do the split? Yeah. There's no kernel component that's doing this? Nothing. Okay. So that clarifies that. The second question is, can this extend to a virtualization model where you can have some dedicated GPU cores for a VM? Things like that, I mean. So, uh, so we're not, not virtualization, but we're running this with Kubernetes and containers. So okay. they can at least work on containers. Okay, it's been proven to work on that? Yes. Okay. So I, I won't pretend to be an expert on GPUs, so apologies if my question is ignorant because of that, but is this an implementation model that can be used uh, independently and generically across any GPU, or is it specific to CUDA kernel? So if I were using AMD ATI GPUs, could I do the exact same implementation? And I guess where I'm going is, is this a kind of proprietary hardware specific implementation, or is it generic to be put into the community to apply horizontally regardless of GPU models, types, et cetera? Well, it's, it is specifically for NVIDIA GPUs, but as long as you have an NVIDIA GPU, it doesn't matter if you have a V100 or RT4 or... If so I, that's, that's, but if I don't have, so it's not generic for any GPU, it's specific to NVIDIA, so no, it's hardware specific? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Exactly. We have this collaboration. I, I would like to say that I think it's generic, okay? The concept of move data direct to accelerator is generic. So if you have accelerator, like NVIDIA GPU, that is able to expose its memory and to register it to capable network device, then you can use it in the exact same way. Okay, there is nothing special here for NVIDIA. It's just right. the fact that their GPU support this kind of uh, memory allocation. Thank okay. You. So if this, if this takes hold, then it could be implemented on any other competitor's yeah. GPU as well. Yeah, and it ha doesn't have to be a GPU. If you have an SSD that you can expose with through the memory IO some portion of it, it can also be done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but the current implementation is for NVIDIA GPUs only. This is what I meant. Okay. I mean, the, the technology per se the, can be, yeah. So yeah we had, for, we had someone know, the, from AMD here, so you could. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm curious, you know, I don't know enough about it. I'm intrigued about it. But I also think back on the origins of the community of how we've made sure that every implementation is generic enough to be on anybody's solution. And if this can be on anybody's solution, great. If it's NVIDIA specific, it's interesting. But I will, I'll look through community leadership to make sure it can be extracted to be able to run on anybody's hardware. Yeah, so so as, as I showed in the slides, where we envision it toward upstream, we see as, the, as it a general use case, where you have a main pool that is populated right. with any kind of memory. And the abilities to provide such memory is either depending on the application and the, uh, and the peripheral device it works with. Okay. It's, it's, it's only a matter of what the device can support and whether or not you have the, so, the software framework to do so. The DPDK APIs are completely generic. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, hello, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. So um, it's kind of, you know, the NIC and the GPU and the CPU together. So have you ever considered other, uh, you know, uh, use uh, FPGA to do the similar work as uh, um, the, the GPU? So why do you choose this combination? Have you think of other, you know, kind of the different uh, arc architecture together? Are you asking why we chose Yeah, why GPU? will you choose the GPU to do these kind of things? Do you ever consider yeah, other? Yeah, so we, we have a very, very large FPGA team, and F, we have a lot of FPGAs on the field, and uh, there's, we have a lot of experience with that, and they, there's just no getting around the fact they take a long time to develop. There's um, just the, the largest FPGAs out there, just compiling them takes hours. And so when you want to make one small change, it, it's, it's a long development time. Um, that being said, FPGAs use less power. It, um, once they're done, they're typically extremely reliable. So it's a trade-off. It's faster development at potentially uh, higher cost running it. So it's just a trade-off that needs to be done. Um, there are FPGA accelerator cards that are PCIe that presumably you could use something like this for. Um, there's even a, there's a PMD for an FPGA card, I think. So you could potentially use it for that as well. Okay. I have a question about implementation. So continuing the question on the memory, you said that for your implementation, you had to take advantage of a shared virtual memory between the host and the GPU, right? So I'm, guess, I'm guessing you were using UVM, and it's known that it has a lot of drawbacks performance-wise. So were you using some kind of different mechanism for the virtual shared memory? So the way we map the GPU memory to the device is, uh, what is the name of the, the, the kernel model? NVPRMEM. NVPRMEM. Mm -hmm. So th there is a small kernel module by NVIDIA that enables to associate a virtual memory with a GPU physical memory. So that every time the CPU access this virtual memory, it as if it access directly to the GPU. Okay, this is one part of the solution. The other part is Manox device being capable to receive this virtual to physical memory mapping and to perform this on the NIC. So the packet arrives and it goes to the virtual address provided by the NV peer mem, and then the physical address belongs to the, GP, to the GPU and the data goes directly to the GPU either by the PCI switch um, or by anti or whatever other minutes uh, can do. Okay, thank you. Right. That link's at the bottom right there on their slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you.